Okay. Uh, Do we have, uh, is this uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson? There he is. Hi. I recognize that face. Uh, 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 were you a wrestler in high school? Yeah, and in college. I was captain of my high school's wrestling team and undefeated. Uh, and then I got to college, and then I started wrestling like corn-fed wrestlers from <laughs> Iowa. <laughs> Uh, that was a whole other. <laughs> uh, you, so I had a losing record in in college, but I was undefeated in high school. That's the difference between local and national sports. I see. Um, uh, we're good friends with the the comedian Greg Warren, um, who uh, has has been working with Bargatze, and he was a really good wrestler. One of the Cornfred boys from Missouri. <laughs> and he's, he, his special is coming out soon. Neil deGrasse Tyson has. A, well, I'm even wearing a. a, a a wrestling. Oh yeah. USA oh, wrestling. I, I didn't. Oh, that's cool. great. I didn't see that. I happen to have it on this morning. Oh, yeah. that's funny. That's funny. I just I was doing some research and I saw those pictures. That's cool. You went to Bronx Science High, right? Yeah, the Bronx High School of Science. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. I knew a bunch of guys that had gone there. I of course didn't because I uh, total lack of a uh, skill in that area. The new <laughs> the, the new book. It's the reissue. Um, it's uh, Merlin's uh, and it's called uh, Tour of the universe, and it's uh, once again uh, prepped for the 21st century. Can you tell us what you had to do to re rework it? Yeah, yeah. So that was my very first book written 35 years ago while I was in graduate school. And resurrecting it, bringing it into the 21st century, I was reminded, I reminded myself how much of my educational, as an educator, how many tap roots were set into motion in the writing of that book, there's a there's a delight. By the way, Merlin is a is a character created for the question and answer format of that book, and Merlin, in fact, is an alien visiting from Andromeda mm -hmm. who has seen all of Earth history, all of Earth his uh, uh, scientific and cultural history. So when you ask Merlin about the universe, Merlin recalls a conversation with some major historical figure because Merlin knew them all. And that was just a fun sort of tool to uh, bring the universe down to earth for whoever had the uh, interest for it. Now, um, do you have any interest in going to space? Yeah, so I have a different definition of space as would be true for all of my colleagues, my astrophysics colleagues. Um, Many people don't realize that the space station, for example, which is anybody's common definition of being in space, if Earth were shrunk to the size of a schoolroom globe, mm -hmm. then the space station is orbiting one centimeter above the surface. Yeah. And so I can't, I'm sorry, I can't think of that as space. <laughs> <laughs> Send me somewhere, moon, Mars, asteroids, beyond. But I, I don't want to just boldly go where hundreds have gone before. <laughs> yeah, and, and these the billionaires who pay to go up in the one where they're in space for like six minutes, that seems to me to be a real ripoff. <laughs> That's even. That's not even as high as the one centimeter. So the billionaire boys race, the Bezos Branson, that, you're right, that's a sub, what's called suborbital. They go up and then just fall back for five, six minutes, and it's the falling part where you're weightless. So that's fun, and you're sort of above the important parts of the atmosphere. So that's fun. Stars will come out in broad daylight because you can't see stars in the daytime because of the scattered blue light from the sun that turns the sky blue. You get above that limit. So that's fun. I no, I no issues with that. But on this same scale with the schoolroom globe, they go up about the thickness of Two dimes. Yeah, wow. and it's costing them, <laughs> costing them several more dimes than that. And remember that guy, that crazy guy, uh, Felix Bumgarner, remember him? Sure, uh, yeah. Who did that edge Hot of space balloon jump? thing, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. For Red Bull? Sure. Okay, how high was he? He was the thickness of one dime ah. above Earth's surface. So we, so we, uh, and NASA is complicit in this. We have a very low bar definition of what it means to go into space. Wow. But so, can we, I'm but sorry, I have higher goals than that. Can we get to Mars, though, feasibly? Is that really a realistic thing? Well, so let me just make it clear. Oh, by the way, of the billionaire boys' space race, right. Elon Musk is the only one who actually puts people in orbit. Okay. okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he's the full one centimeter up, and that's why mm -hmm. he can intersect with the space station if he chooses. The... Uh, Unlike 
the 1950s where people said, will we ever get to the moon? Do we know how? Is it even possible? That's not the kinds of questions anyone is invoking today about Mars. The questions are not, is it possible? Of course it's possible. We have an SUV-sized rover that took a helicopter to Mars, exploring Mars right now. Getting to Mars, that's not the issue. So the issue is, what's the motivation? And who's going to write the check? That's all it comes down to. It's not any more complicated than that. So you that. can survive that trip to Mars? A human being can well, It's nine months. It. Yeah, just get okay. a good Netflix account, you know. <laughs> maybe, maybe listen to Neil deGrasse Tyson. He's got a couple of podcasts out there. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Yes. I, yeah. I have a podcast that'll yeah. keep you going. <laughs> there you go. Uh, uh, uh. Our it's guest is... Star is Talk podcast. While you look out the window, you can think <laughs> of the universe. Do, Thanks do you, for that plug. Do you like to be called um, Dr. deGrasse Tyson or um, Professor? Oh, what? so in a first introduction, just Neil deGrasse Tyson, and after that, just Neil. Okay. But here's the thing. If you start heaping titles and pedigree, then what? as an educator, what I don't like is it comes with the implicit assumption that you should pay attention to what I say because of that title. When I think you should pay attention to what I say because I'm freaking making sense to you. Yeah, it's interesting. That's, that's, that's <laughs> That should be enough reason. Yeah. So yeah. I, I never like being um, surrounded by, by pedigree. Yeah. I think it's, it's, a, it's a charade. Not a charade. What's the right word there? It's, a, it's an attempt to boost the value of what you say without actually investing in the meaning and importance of what you say. Kind of an, an, an eminence front, as, uh, <laughs> as uh, Roger Daltrey would sing, or Pete Townsend in The Who. Uh, uh, go Neil, ahead. is um, our galaxy finite? Or is this an... I have a real problem with grasping infinity. And uh, since a kid, like even when I was a kid, I was very interested in space and the galaxies and reading about them, but... It's very hard to think it, it just goes on and on and on for billions and billions and billions of years. Yeah, so I, I agree. At my first sort of existential crisis about infinity mm -hmm. <laughs> occurred when I was five years old. <laughs> and I'm old enough because I remember the Kennedy assassination, the, the John Kennedy assassination. And when they buried him in... in um, Arlington. Or Arlington National Cemetery, and they had this 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 lamp there, this flame, mm -hmm. and they called it the Eternal Flame. And I said, "Eternal? What? It's going to, for like forever? Like, doesn't it take fuel? Don't you have to put?" I had this. It's like, what does that even mean? And so that's that was my first encounter with sort of infinity. Uh, so our galaxy, just to get the term straight, is the collection of stars. Uh, called the Milky Way, we are one of several hundred billion stars. That has an edge. Its gravity reaches forever, but that where the stars are, that has an edge. And then there are other galaxies, and then other galaxies. There may be a trillion of them oh. in the observable universe. The universe has a horizon beyond which we cannot see, but that doesn't mean the universe doesn't continue beyond that any more than a ship at sea that sees its horizon. Are they saying to themselves, that's the edge of the ocean. My, my, I'm in the center of my own ocean. No, they know that if you sail a little bit, there's more ocean that shows up. So our horizon occurs because the speed of light is finite. It's not infinite. And the universe is not infinitely old. So galaxies at our horizon they, their light is only now just reaching us given the history of the universe. So that's how we get a horizon. So, but yeah, the universe itself might be infinite and just like deal with it. <laughs> yeah, there we go. That's the answer. Neil deGrasse Tyson is our guest. And, uh, Can you tell Neil, my priest that? Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson is uh, going on tour. Um, the tour can do. Can you tell us a little bit about what are the live tour stops like? I know you've got a bunch of them in places where people can hear us right now. Yeah, yeah. So the the uh, tour slightly misrepresents it because usually, if it quote an artist goes on tour, they got something to sell you, and that's the whole point of the tour. Uh, my my relationship with cities is a little different from that. What happens is I get invited to the theater. Typically, there's a grand dam theater that's been renovated. Beautiful theaters, Fox theaters, Paramount theaters. This mm -hmm. kind the kind where we all used to well, old timers would go to see movies. Right. That's <laughs> right. 
where curtain would open up. The, those theaters have been in most cities renovated and they're beautiful to perform in. I send those, the, the host, a list of a dozen or 15 talks that I could give and then they pick one. And then I deliver that talk on that location. So t talk titles include a cosmic perspective. Uh, one of my favorites is an astrophysicist goes to the movies where I show a bunch of movie clips and just rail on them for the science <laughs> they got right or wrong, you know, especially wrong. And it's not just sci-fi. Um, I, I have two movie talks. One of them, I talk about uh, uh, the Wizard of Oz, how the scarecrow gets the Pythagorean theorem wrong <laughs> when he recites math. <laughs> After the yeah. wizard gives him a brain or gives him a diploma. So they're just fun little places oh, that's, where that's so has attempted to reach, but then has not. So, yeah, so if you ever see my name in a city, check what the topic is. Because it's not, I'm not there to, even though I might have a book that you could buy, that's not the point of the talk. Oh, these sound great. Uh, yeah. By the way, uh, speaking of books, Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, the revised edition of his first book, uh, Merlin's Tour of the Universe, is out. And um, he's going to be in a bunch of spots doing these various talks. I, it's one of my questions was going to be about movies. Uh, if if you were, f for example, in the NFL, I'd say what is the best what is the best movie about the NFL? Since you're not, well, let's go with uh, what what is your let's do your, you, the best or your favorite movie about space and all the things that you've been studying your whole life? Yeah, I was. Uh, let me say the most accurate. Yeah. One is I think without question, The Martian. Oh, wow. uh, Andy yeah. Weir was an engineer, the author of the story, engineer turned novelist. And he actually uh, gave me the hot, one of the highest compliments I've ever had. I had him on my podcast, by the way, my Star Talk podcast. He said, Neil, when I was writing this book, because the, the whole story is deeply infused with science, so much so that science, you can think of it almost as a character in the storytelling, because the, ma the main uh, protagonist is left for dead on Mars. Mm -hmm. And then they find out he's actually alive. And so he has to stay alive for all the days that it takes for them to come back and rescue him. So he has to be very ingenious about how to not die. And that's where the science comes from. Andy Weir told me that while he was writing the novel, he imagined I was looking over his shoulder. <laughs> he didn't want anything showing up in a tweet, you know. About the I take that as a high compliment. Oh, that's great. Uh, with respect to a sort of sci-fi space travel, do you have a, 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 a one accuracy versus favorite? Yeah, thank you for splitting that difference because uh, that would be the most accurate. I would say Armageddon, even though... It violates more laws of physics per minute. <laughs> I, I would say Armageddon is just sheer joy. It's just, it's, it's, there's good comedy, there's good action, good special effects. And uh, so, yeah, I think go for it. Okay. Armageddon. Um, I've got a story for you, real quick. We've had uh, uh, Dr. David Wolf, the astronaut, in here a lot. And I'll never forget the story he tells. He goes, you don't know what quiet is till you've been in the mirror and the power goes out and you can hear your blood circulating. Mm. Mm. That's okay, so scary. You, you can duplicate that. Uh, I when I was a kid, when I was in college, I spent a summer at Bell Laboratories back when they were a big powerhouse. And they have what's called an anechoic chamber. Right. There. Cool. which is a huge room with these big foam absorbers on the ceiling, on all the walls, and on the floor. Because you're not walking on the floor, you're walking on a mesh that is suspended between all of these walls. And there is no echo anywhere. And so you're in there, and all of a sudden, you start hearing blood pulsing through your ear canal and you start to sense your heartbeat. And if someone else walks in, you practically have to scream to them even if they're only 10 feet away. So maybe it's not as perfect an environment as space, but it's as close as you can get. If you ever have a chance to go into an anechoic chamber, look those up. Oh, that's super uh, cool. Yeah. And then yeah. Um, before we let you go, uh, um, I'll remind everybody, the book, once again, um, one of many by Neil deGrasse Tyson. And you've got your podcast. Where do people find the podcast? Oh, it's Star Talk Podcast. Yeah, Spotify, 
Uh, it's also on a uh, Apple podcast. And you work with a comedian. Uh, <laughs> yes. Oh, thank you. Yes. So my co-host, just the, the, the podcast is we take people from the world. They could be famous actors, politicians. It doesn't matter who. And we explore what science may have affected their lives in whatever storytelling they they engaged in for a movie they were in or whatever, but, but what songs they might have composed. We interviewed Katy Perry, and I had to ask her, she's got a song about, like, Boning an alien, I think. That's uh -huh. what <laughs> you talked about. Uh -huh. Your ray, you know, vibrate me with your ray gun. It's like, wow. okay. So, but anyhow, so I have a my co host is a professional comedian, Chuck Nice. And so it's pop culture, comedy, and science woven together into one package. And that's the what distinguishes. Uh, that podcast. Right. Oh, it's, oh, it's so great talking to you. I've been uh, listening yes. to you on various uh, podcasts, et cetera, et cetera, for years. And um, you certainly um, put a nice spin on uh, my ability to learn anything. <laughs> and I have I have visited the Hayden Planetarium. I was just there a couple of years ago. Went to a couple oh, broad, went to a couple of Broadway shows, and then went to the Planetarium, which is awesome. Uh, of course. Oh, one other quick note about a movie. Uh, the uh, remember uh, Interstellar came out ten years ago. It's being re released to theaters. December uh, this year, 2024. So that one is chock full of science, especially since the executive producer was a professor of theoretical physics at Caltech. So you know they're going to get it right. And so that's that's just sheer bath in scientific, uh, in, in Einstein relativity and other kinds of science uh, uh, enlightenment. Did you see the article a couple of weeks ago, speaking of Einstein's relativity, about the, the monkeys? <laughs> And how they now is that the, some group of scientists said, no, no, no. An infinite number of monkeys could not type all of the Shakespeare plays. That had to be but No, I missed that. Yeah. I'm surprised. I don't believe that. I have, have to check on yeah, that. Google, Google. <laughs> an infinite number of monkeys for an infinite amount of time. So, yeah, I'm it, pretty it, sure it, they can type Shakespeare. Well, yeah, I, I, I don't know. It, was, it made the New York Times. I'm not sure what it means. Okay, I guess if it's an infinite number of monkeys for a day, no. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, see, well, there's an argument to be made. La real quick, one last question. 2001. Uh, amazing, I thought, how uh, so much of the stuff in that, you consider what year Kubrick made that. Really amazing. Yeah, so that movie, 1968, and imagining a future, before we landed on the moon, reminder, uh, 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 imagining a future in the year 2001. Now, so there's a whole space station up there with space shuttles docking with them. So it, it was a fantastical view, especially in the day. It, it was opening the door to possibilities in everyone's imagination of what we could be doing in space. Now, of course, sci-fi know that you want to rotate a space station so that you have artificially created gravity on the perimeter. So that way you don't have muscle loss or mm -hmm. bone loss and all the rest of that. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, then, then the movie got like really weird at the end. Yeah, and I found out that Stanley Kubrick, since nobody really understood the movie, uh, then I I heard what he said about it. He said the movie's not intended to be understood; it's intended to be experienced. I said, okay, he got that. We, yeah. <laughs> we'll give it to him. And yeah, that's I'm not sure movie. what that means. Apparently, <laughs> marijuana got very popular about '68. <laughs> Neil deGrasse Tyson, what a great pleasure, sir! Thank you so yes. much. And uh, I'm, I can't wait to go through the book, see, see all the cool things you got in here. Thank you so much. And, and I'm impressed you still have Bob's name in the title of your show. Br it's, br it's branding, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> uh, find out from your family why you have a hyphenated last name. Get back to me. Same thing. <laughs> uh, well, how cool. I love yes. this guy. Uh, and he's, he's going to be um, uh, all over the country doing his talks. I would love to hear the one, the two, about movies. Oh, yeah. Mm. Those sound yeah. really, that sounds like a lot of fun.